eh, hacer ajustes. Pero de otro lado, algunos de los países que están aquí con nosotros han tenido, sin embargo, crecimientos muy buenos. Ha sido el caso de, de Paraguay, en el caso de Costa Rica. El presidente lo puede contar más adelante. Estaba demorada una reforma tributaria durante mucho tiempo. Es justamente el tipo de, de cosas que se tienen que hacer, que empezó otra vez a remontar su crecimiento. O en el caso de un país como Ecuador, que es una economía dolarizada y que en, en, en su conjunto el hecho de tener un dólar revalorizándose pues afectaba también eh, su economía. ¿Qué vemos hacia adelante? Digamos, la historia lo que nos muestra es que cada vez que viene un proceso de aumento de tasas de interés, sobre todo de la Reserva Federal de los Estados Unidos, algo pasa en el sistema global. La pregunta entonces es, ¿qué debemos hacer los países latinoamericanos para ajustarnos a una realidad que está ahí? De hecho, con los solos aumentos que se dieron, vimos los efectos, eh, sobre todo en el último trimestre, sumado al hecho de que nuestras economías y sobre todo las economías suramericanas son economías mucho más abiertas, que tienen una alta dependencia de la economía asiática y principalmente de la China y que están concentradas sus exportaciones en cinco o seis productos básicos. Y allí es donde yo creo que la tarea que viene por delante es cómo profundizamos mucho más nuestros procesos de integración y cómo nos preparamos, digamos, para ese momento en que va a haber eh, un clima no tan bueno para hacer el conjunto de reformas estructurales que son muy fáciles de hablar, muy difíciles de implementar, pero que van a ser centrales para darle un mayor espacio al sector privado para crecer. Y creo que eso es lo que vamos a tener que ver eh, en los años por venir. Una de las razones por las cuales es tan atractivo para los presidentes del mundo eh, venir aquí es poder conversar con empresarios que tienen... Uh posibilidades de inversión, etcétera. Y todos los países presentan unas ideas acerca de por qué es atractivo ese país para la inversión extranjera. Yo quería darle a los tres presidentes la oportunidad de explicar qué tiene su país que no tienen otros para atraer a los inversionistas. O sea, ¿qué, qué tienen de especial ustedes? ¿Por qué no comenzamos con el presidente Lenín Moreno? Bueno, eh, mira, Moisés, eh, yo creo que si es que hay algo que diferencia al Ecuador de los otros países es la extraordinaria diversidad que tiene en un pequeño territorio. El Ecuador tiene riquezas por encima de su suelo y por debajo de su suelo. Por encima de su suelo, pues una diversidad arquitectónica, una diversidad en su clima, una diversidad en su paisaje, en su fauna, en su flora, en sus, en sus etnias, inclusive. Es importante que cuando se recorre el Ecuador encuentras... Diversidad de vestimenta, diversidad de folclore, diversidad de, de música. El approach would be to say, well, government just going to provide the social services. If there's a marginalized group, we'll just do it. Well, the problem with that is that in, in Latin America and in many other uh, uh, parts of the world, is that people tend to think like that. But the end result is that you are very inefficient, very slow, and the end result, you have those problems. Because when I look at that, it's when a lot of years we were using that system. That system doesn't work enough or it's not good enough for solving the problems of the people and or at least not fast enough. And I think this point of, you know, you've got uh, a pretty developed country, but you still have these marginalized groups of people who need, who need help can be applied maybe to bring Anne into the discussion to the business world writ large where there are a lot of successful corporations, businesses doing great in many ways, but it's not as connected to some of the issues you're talking about. That's starting to change with this focus on ESG, on environmental, social, and governance factors. This is something you, you think a lot about and work a lot on at Bank of America. Can we actually get these, you know, when we think of billions and trillions, the, the financial markets, the sorts of folks who are here at Davos, can we actually connect them to people who don't have running water or who, who are uh, recently incarcerated? Or can we connect them to those kinds of uh, the people really being left behind in today's economy? Yes, we can connect them. I think the thing is that um, it's taken a while to get there. And ESG is really a way, at least from my perspective, a way of thinking, a way of uh, looking at problems, but you then have to bring in, in our case, because we're a bank, how can we bring uh, capital to the issue? And how can we use the innovation we've used for corporations and clients for many years, hundreds of years, and apply it to this? And we've had success, but it means blended finance, meaning um, 
different tranches of financing against a gnarly project that otherwise wouldn't get done. Mm -hmm. It reduces the risk. It gives different horizons for payback. It, um, it allows also outcomes to be determined. So uh, earlier today we were talking about water equity. There is um, a water equity fund that Gary White and Matt Damon started uh, that we participated in. We, we gave them the first $5 million into it. It is uh, a $50 million fund. It returns about 3 3 3.5% to the investors. And with that money, they can um, uh, provide water to thousands of people. It's a micro loan, so something that we couldn't do directly, but they can do, and we can provide the financing and also find other partners. And we've been able to take something like that and parlay that to um, probably in the last year $50 billion worth of investments in whether it's health care, water, uh, clean air, uh, women's issues, in a way that we would not have been able to do five years ago. It's taken some innovation. It's taken some very good bankers. It's taken um, uh, partnerships with other financial institutions, NGOs, development banks, philanthropies that we couldn't have even imagined just a few years ago. Yeah, that's a great, the Matt Damon and Gary White example is a great one because, you know, they started out basically working like civil engineers would, digging right. wells, you know, we need to get water to people, let's go dig another well. Now they've turned into financial engineers. Right, but you know, that began with, we were uh, one of their earliest contributors. Gary had a checking account with us uh, and um, uh, we gave him a philanthropic gift. He sort of took us through what he was trying to do and it, it's an evolution. But the evolution can start a revolution, and we've been able to do it well beyond water. Um, we've been able to do it with solar, with wind power, um, uh, a project we're doing on uh, solar in India that uh, I couldn't have imagined. This and these are on big scales now. You, met, you mentioned this at the beginning of your remarks, and I want to bring Aaron in on this point, that it's happening, we're moving, it's a mindset shift, but that it's not happening as quickly as we might want, right? The urgency doesn't seem to be there. We could have had this conversation several years ago. Wouldn't have been as advanced as we might have now. There wouldn't have been as many reports or data points to prove, or many, as many case studies and examples. But look at the headlines. I mean, there's urgency around equity, right? I mean, there are literally people in the streets in a lot of countries in the world. How do we get there faster? Well, it, it, I think the dominant reality right now is that we're living through a time with uh, very profound interconnected revolutions, economic revolutions, technological revolutions, cultural, political. And so um, I, I would say that as important as building sustainable markets uh, is, and it, and it certainly is, we need to build resilient markets that can help us navigate uh, all of this change. I'll come to economic fairness mm -hmm. in just a second. And we're also reforming our country to, to invest in human capital, in education, we're improving our health system, and we're constructing a, a digital agenda and heading a process in this new um, phase. We're going to um, um, use technology to, um, to bring the country forward. Paraguay has to be seen by the world as a strategic, strategic ally of complementary economy and a place to be able to access the markets of the region and the world. And integration is the process that Paraguay requires to be able to go forth and to be interpreted as or seen as a strategic ally. You have all spoken of the hopeful side of Latin America and of each of your countries. And I'd like you to answer this question as uh, citizens of Latin America and not uh, so much as presidents of your country. What are these two damned numbers, 8 and 31. 8 is 8%, and America has 8% of the world's population. And 31 is 31% of homicide 
en Latinoamérica. De América Latina, con 8% en la With población, mata of population, a 31% de la población. Uh, they kill 31% of the population eh, eso, según las encuestas, world. Uh, es la principal preocupación And that de América is the main Entonces, si antes les pregunté qué hacer y qué decirle a los inversionistas, ahora les pregunto qué hacer y qué decirle said, a un pueblo latinoamericano que dice las encuestas que su principal angustia, su principal preocupación uh, the people of Latin America who uh, eh, the uh, interviews eh, say that their main concern uno, is uh, the, bueno, uh, buena the para Paraguay. murder Paraguay index. That's good news for Paraguay because our uh, percentage drops year to year. The, uh, the index that we use gives us 7.3%. At its highest rate, whereas in other countries, uh, I'm not going to talk about other countries, but Paraguay's uh, rates are much lower as far as murder goes. In the region, there are some countries that have very, very high percentages, and that brings up the average for the whole region of Latin America. We consider that the main causes are inse of insecurity are the lack, is the lack of opportunities. In small districts where they export, 90% of the population exports uh, bananas, the uh, murder rate drops 90%. So what we're doing is to create uh, policies to generate employment and strengthen our capability and awareness through public policies that allow to generate work and progress options identifying each region with the need of investment. President, your country, your neighbors in Latin America are very, have very high rates, don't, don't they? Well, yes, the, death, the murder rate is very high in Latin America, and in Costa Rica, our murder rate was, was, was rising, but from 2012, the murder rate was growing, and this last year, <coughs> we managed to reduce it. We were at 12 uh, murders per 100,000 inhabitants, and now we're down to 11 point something. The main thing uh, in insecurity is connected to um, inequality. Uh, Latin America is one of the most unequal re regions of the world. Usando datos y estadísticas y ciencia de datos de eh, la policía. Y de una forma preventiva, are drawn from the police records. And one of the measures we took to reduce murders was uh, the confiscation of weapons. Ya no solo para el tema de seguridad, sino para combatir la desigualdad. We have lots of inequality in the region, and when we look at a map uh, to see where most murder takes place, we see that territorially this, these are very specific areas where uh, what is required is a policy of opportunities. And this has been done successfully in a number of countries by creation of leisure options, prevention of drugs, um, new opportunities for the youth, for women, the creation of new jobs. And that is, is very hopeful. In Medellin, for instance, there have been very positive uh, experiences in that respect, and they have managed to reduce them their rates. And this is not a problem that affects us only as a country, but rather as a region. And we need cooperation. We are not cooperating sufficiently to overcome these, uh, these scourges. I know that the mayor of Medellin is, is with us here present, so I'd like him to, to talk to us on the topic as well. President Lenin Moreno, from the perspective of 
Ecuador, an Andine country, and all that is connected to drugs and narco traffic, drug trafficking. The Ministry of Interior, who's, who controls the police, has carried out a number of actions which has seen a drop in murder rates over the last few years. But there's also a bad side to this, the fact that that uh, murder rate is, has gone up for women. And this is due to uh, uh, this is due to uh, an, an, an ancient belief where uh, a man thinks that the woman is his property, his property. So feminicides happen when women take decisions on, on their own accord, and if they take decisions. Um, men feel betrayed, offended, and they resort to this abhorrent action. And to solve this problem, we have to promote values and their practice, and especially help children not fall into the, these traps by teaching them human rights and basic values from their very early childhood so that they start understanding that women have a right to choose. And that, I think, is something that is going to contribute enormously to reduce the feminicide rate. Obviously, there are other aspects that uh, play a role in, de in murder rates, criminality uh, related to drug trafficking mainly, and that too is being combated in a very open and frank way through an effective action of the Ministry of Defence uh, together with the help of the Ministry of Interior and the Home Office. And we are concerned because the rates of drug consumption are on the rise, and that is certainly a, a huge concern. And we are tackling this problem by promoting values and by imbuing in the youth and in children that they should identify with the beauty of life without resorting to miserable substitutes as drugs. President Moreno, this 8 and 31 percent. Moises, we can look at this from a different angle. One of the things that is most surprising in the what was called the lost generation of the 80s, we had murder rates and criminality rates which were far lower than what we have seen in the last few years where re we can, without a shadow of a doubt, say that they have been the worst years of Latin America in by and large. And uh, connecting to what President Alvarado said, I would like to stress that we have to understand that the security policy does not only depend on, strictly on the police or the army, because it cannot be successful unless each dollar spent is to improve with an extra dollar in social investment, apart from the police and social justice, to uh, tackle the problems that are at the, the, the basis of the problems of security. And as President Alvarado said, we have also uh, seen that in many cases we can see uh, where crime takes place, where murder takes place in these small areas, and we can tackle this problem by, for instance, using sport, creating social tissue, creating microfinance, um, entrepreneurship, and education, because the lack of security 
it scares away the institutions of the state, and that space, that empty space, is taken over by criminality. So that has to be stopped. It has to be tampered. And President Alvarado uh, will know what we did in Costa Rica, because what we have seen is that most of the interns in prisons go back, when they come out of prison, go back to do the same as they were doing before. So what happens in prison is that while the, the inmate is in pre prison, the family uh, creates a network to receive him when he comes out. And there is no doubt that there is um, um, a thin line that connects all this, which is drug trafficking and a number of other um, actions that nourish drug trafficking as is, of course, as, we, uh, as has been mentioned, the case of Medellin. They have problems in Medellin with security, with bringing up to date the whole police system, the whole uh, forensic department, and everything that is connected to prisons. Basically, uh, the, uh, prisons were headquarters of, uh, of, of the criminals that operated from prison. And there are a number of policies that are starting to be successful, and this is not so much an action that governments carry out. It's, uh, governments have to uh, unite their efforts with cities to be able to tackle these problems. Before giving the floor, opening, before I give the floor to the audience, could you, we uh, talk about uh, the uh, major humanitarian crisis that we have at the moment in Latin America? And it's the worst we've ever faced, and that's the crisis from Venezuela. Very quickly, because we're running out of time, but I would like to hear what you think about this. So what can we do? What might we be able to do in the face of the tragedy that Venezuela is now going through? Let's begin with you. Well, Paraguay decided that it would break off diplomatic relations with the government of Venezuela. And I think we were the only country in the region that did so. And we were trying to be consistent and joined up in our thinking because we do have a serious concern. Venezuela was a beacon that shone a light on democracy in Latin America. And if you see what has happened now, I think we have to be very clear cut and very specific in what we say. We do hope that we will be able to reestablish dialogue. We hope that there will be a way out, a peaceful way out of the situation. And we do hope that they will find their way back to uh, democracy in Venezuela. But uh, we will uh, certainly uh, support any humanitarian aid that might be given. And if necessary, um, in fact, we've discussed this with presidents in the region, uh, particularly those who have uh, the greatest influx of um, Venezuelans. You see them queuing up and you see them walking along uh, the highways. And uh, you see them, uh, but uh, it is uh, very painful. But these people People come out smiling because they want to come into other countries, they want to work. What we therefore need to do is uh, to look at the financial side of this uh, so that we can uh, provide uh, solidarity with those countries who are getting the most number of uh, Venezuelans in. I think this should be a world cause, really, Venezuela. Um, President Alvarado, yes, I agree with what's just been said, really. And I think this is a particular juncture at the moment, and it's complex. It's not just uh, Venezuela. I'd look at Nicaragua as well in the same breath, really. And 
I think that this is important for Latin America because we have to make sure that the institutions, the democratic institutions, come up with regional solutions. And this has to be part of a mature political approach. I don't think we should isolate these and just pretend that these are national or domestic problems. These impinge on us as well. And I think there's been a discussion on this. And we have to look at what it actually means when we talk about intervention. We're talking about human rights. And, and Hemingway once said, um, for whom the bell tolls. Well, it's not just for them that the bell is tolling. It is also for us that it's tolling. And we're listening to that bell tolling. We have that ringing in our ears. And therefore, it is important that we look at this. Venezuela is certainly a dramatic case. And we understand that in Colombia, I think you've got more than a million people uh, who have um, fled in Costa Rica. And uh, we uh, have about a half a million Nicaraguans, not uh, just uh, through that, but because uh, of that, uh, there are more than uh, 80,000 people who have sought refuge in our country. And, uh, they, and this is because of a breakdown in uh, democracy. There's no free press and various other problems. And uh, we couldn't uh, just see this as a problem that relates just to Nicaragua or Venezuela. I think we have to see this as part of the well-being of the whole region. And we also have to see this uh, about uh, the um, uh, trade between all these Central American countries is being affected by that. It is dampening trade. And also remittances aren't being paid either. And a lot of families depend on those remittances which come from abroad. Now, uh, Nicaragua uh, has got negative uh, growth, and this drags down the whole region. So I think saying uh, that we're being interventionist or that uh, this has to be sorted out domestically, uh, I think uh, is an, uh, a refusal to see that this affects the whole region. And I think if my neighbor is going better, is doing better, both democratically and economically, then of course that is going to redound to my benefit. And I think there's a certain majority that we're talking about in our approach to this. We have to look at uh, what we're doing uh, in the institutions. And I think in this way, by taking that approach, we should find a way out. President Moreno Garcia, Garces. Thank you, Chair. Before Maduro won in Venezuela, Venezuela had said that, uh, and we had said, uh, that uh, any election had to be held democratically and uh, the opposition should be allowed to stand and uh, to be active and uh, they should not try and trip them up, as has indeed happened. And there should also be international observers as well on as broad a front as possible to check impartially whether the elections had been correct and fair. And we, as we often do, and this is very much part of our policy, we also sought a dialogue so that it would be possible to come up with a peaceful solution. But the answer to our call was negative. And the result of that, I think, has been uh, this um, exodus of more than two million Venezuelans. They have uh, gone uh, particularly to Ecuador and Colombia, Peru and Chile. In Ecuador, the uh, Venezuelan migrants have uh, come in, uh, it's um, uh, 770,000, and we have respected their rights, uh, and we have uh, provided schooling, health, and work. But of course, we have called on uh, the uh, Venezuelan government uh, to themselves sort out the humanitarian crisis that they have. There is about 6,000 uh, are coming into uh, Ecuador and it's going to over the three or four months. And these are 6,000 coming in daily over these uh, few months. And uh, we have uh, been in touch with the Ministry of uh, Communication of Venezuela and uh, they said it wasn't, uh, they said it's not 6,000 a day, 
675,300. So, no, I'm not surprised uh, because uh, we all have sometimes uh, have our problems with numbers, and we know ministers over communication uh, um, uh, would uh, also uh, have uh, certain problems with numbers. So, the solution, as we see it, and uh, as uh, our President Alvarado has said, is that we have to all get together to sort this out together. It has to be a joint effort. And I don't believe in being interventionist, I don't believe in military intervention, but I would say we should intervene in a way that we could call for human rights to be respected. And that is certainly not happening at the moment in Venezuela. And what we hope is, because the Venezuelan government uh, would be uh, sensitive to this and uh, that they uh, come to a dialogue as the best way uh, to uh, resolve this issue so that they can uh, really start going down a path to democracy, which is what the people of Venezuela deserve. Now, question from the... Could I ask, there was a question you asked just now and uh, about uh, something terrible that happened in Ecuador where a Venezuelan killed a woman and and of course, uh, there was something of a reaction against uh, Venezuelans throughout the society. And uh, I think perhaps uh, I think there were certain uh, militia or certain groups that set themselves up. I can't quite remember the full details of it, but there were certain uh, groups uh, that were uh, sort of got involved. Let's, let's talk about that case. Let's say something about that. Yeah, I'll tell you about that. Now, uh, there were certain brigades, uh, the professional brigades that we set up, and there were people from the Ministry of Labor and also, and also from social uh, ministry and also human rights. What we wanted to make sure was that uh, the companies were actually uh, um, having proper work contracts and that, that people weren't going into precarious work. But also we saw that uh, um, our brethren were coming in from Venezuela, but they had no documentation. They had absolutely no documentation. And uh, to get an identity document uh, shouldn't be too difficult. And uh, therefore, we had people coming in without those documents. Uh, but uh, there was, uh, the thing was, uh, that uh, now some people might have uh, been um, in prison, freed, and then dropped off at the borders. And uh, therefore, that was why there was that suspicion. And uh, they often didn't want to tell us uh, what their past was. They didn't want to, to tell us what their criminal record might be. And uh, they weren't uh, providing us uh, with any police records at all. And they, were con uh, they didn't want to, and this, of course, caused concern. And uh, that is why uh, we are asking people uh, to uh, say what their police um, uh, records are. We would like to have some kind of background check. Now, you spoke about the murder of a woman uh, by a Venezuelan, quite a, doubtless. This was uh, terrible, and it's terrible to see such acts. And uh, this is something that everyone is, gets, is really concerned about. But if we look at the statistics, it is uh, possible that this may well happen. But of course, what we want to do is try and avoid things. And, and I think it, what we can do to help things is uh, to get people's criminal records. We can call upon the uh, Venezuelan government to produce uh, that information. And I think that would help people coming in uh, to our area. Now, now President Moran, there's an economic side to all of this. How would you view it? Well, I think what really shocks us is that uh, if you look at the, the UN numbers for the last four years, then uh, about uh, two and a half million have uh, left, and uh, about 1.8 million have, uh, particularly Syrians, and have come into Europe. So uh, you've always uh, spoken about this, and uh, of course uh, the um, news is uh, the importance of the news depends on where that news is being released. But uh, we can see that the terrible things have happened here. 
And uh, I think that what is quite admirable in Latin America, and I think with this uh, holds good for all countries, is that they have uh, welcomed in uh, these people. There's the Caraguans gone into Costa Rica. There are Haitians who have gone to uh, Chile and uh, to other Central Americans. And the Central Americans have gone into Mexico. But uh, never have uh, we had such huge movement of people. And what we see, and if you uh, read uh, the history of such migrations, uh, the numbers are just going to grow. Because uh, you uh, perhaps set up a family in Ecuador, and they might uh, get a job, but they might establish themselves, and then they're going to call in the rest of their family. So uh, what uh, we're seeing is, first, that we have to think uh, very seriously. Uh, let's not uh, consider it to be something like it is in uh, Jordan, where you have uh, refugee camps with more than a million people in them, and they haven't been there just one year. They've been there 10 years, even 15 years, and that would be very serious indeed for our countries. So we have to think, how can we integrate these people? And to do that, we need to give them uh, the uh, wherewithal, be it in Quito, be it in Lima, be it in Buenos Aires, wherever, so that uh, we can uh, welcome them in so that we can provide the public services, education, um, housing, um, primary health care, because, because the health care level in Venezuela is terrible at the moment, and you can see people coming in across the border, and there are actually sick bays on the border, so that these people who are coming in, some of them are bringing malaria with them, something, uh, and there's, some of them are bringing measles as well. So we've got these sick bays on the border so they don't um, infect the rest of the population. But the situation for Venezuelans is terrible because uh, they have lost uh, what they basically had. Uh, uh, they have uh, absolutely no goods, no services, uh, there's no respect really. And uh, therefore, I would agree with what uh, the other presidents have said, that uh, this is uh, not uh, something uh, that uh, we can uh, just see as someone else's problem. We all need to act together here. And uh, by acting uh, together so that we can uh, bring about a Venezuela which will be different to what it was, so that we can, however, bring together all these different parties in the country. And now in our bank, we uh, do certain household uh, surveys, and uh, the rate of impoverishment of the Vel Venezuelans uh, is uh, huge. It's uh, really happening apace. Uh, and uh, you can uh, look at uh, the drop-off in uh, oil income, and basically the country is imploding and people are just getting out uh, sort of while they can. Now, I think there's Rodrigo Maniarca in the room. He's uh, the minister of uh, the Cuban trade minister. Now, could I ask you? Now, uh, we know that Cuba has a lot of uh, influence in Venezuela. So uh, what advice are you giving the, the Venezuelans at the moment? What are you telling the Venezuelans to, so that they can get a handle on this crisis? I am. I'm oh. uh, vice president of the European Commission, but if... if is Rodrigo oh, sorry, is Rodrigo uh, Magueco in the room? Is the person I was... He was just now. He was here just now. Oh, oh well, sorry. So Cuba's, uh, Cuba's gone AWOL in this conversation. I'm sorry. Uh, bueno, you have the... Go ahead. Be, please be, be brief. Hmm? I'll be very brief. Uh, so, Honorable President, I'm Jyrki Katainen, Vice President of European Commission. I have a question to Abdo, President Abdo Benitez, uh, as we uh, belong to the same group in a sense that Mercosur countries are negotiating with the European Commission on trade agreement. We believe that it would enhance trade between 500 million Europeans and a significant amount of uh, your citizens of your, your countries and help uh, foreign direct investments to come, for instance, to your country. So we have very good ex chances to finalize you know, successfully trade negotiations during this year, but it needs a strong polit political push and commitment. So how would you describe from Mercosur's side the, the current situation? And second question is, how do you see the, the future of Mercosur? How, what is the dynamism of Mercosur at the moment? Mercosur, well, the last meeting that we had between the presidents of Mercosur, we decided that we would move forward 
and we would be very um, uh, want her to bring to an end this uh, negotiation between Mercosur and the uh, European Union. Now, this is, uh, of course, mainly between uh, the larger countries, uh, France, Italy, Brazil, and there are certain uh, existing agreements. But uh, as Mercosur, uh, we are convinced that uh, this uh, an integration that we have to do as soon as we can so that we can bring to a successful conclusion uh, this um, process. Well, I don't think I have, I mean, I, do I have time to say any more? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can finish off. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. finish it off. I'm convinced now because this is being discussed. A lot of us have been talking about integration today and whether that's the way forward or not. And I think the history of humanity is a history of human integration. Every country has its own system of internal integration, different cultures come together, and so on. And uh, these have uh, grown together and emerged over time. So, uh, what I would say, uh, talking about our integration uh, between Mercosur and the uh, European uh, Union uh, is uh, that we should try and uh, deepen these efforts uh, worldwide. And uh, indeed, we uh, believe uh, uh, that uh, perhaps some of the problem has been when it becomes too ideological. Uh, I think it has to be based on a complementarity and it has to be based on the potential of each country. And therefore, we uh, very much want uh, to strengthen this uh, process. Thank you, Chair. In the National Assembly of uh, Venezuela, they um, uh, chose uh, unanimously uh, who their um, members. The Lima group feels that uh, Maduro, President Maduro, has usurped uh, the uh, office of president and uh, the vote was not legitimate and therefore they're not uh, recognizing him as president uh, of uh, Venezuela. The, uh, at the moment there's a uh, power vacuum and uh, the uh, parliament is trying to sort that out and it should be Juan Guaido who is uh, the speaker who should take that. Uh, now, if the uh, parliament uh, decides that Juan Guaido would be appointed, would that be recognized as the legitimate president of Venezuela if he gets uh, um, appointed. A very simple question uh, for you all. A very simple question. President Moreno. <laughs> Don't you want to ask him? <laughs> yeah, that's what Morenos are like. We like to share. We like to share. We have uh, no relationship with the uh, government of Venezuela, so uh, it's in default just at the moment. So this doesn't mean that we can't uh, talk to the Venezuelans. And if uh, there is a structure in place where the assembly uh, chooses uh, an official, and uh, so that they can see a way and who's going to try and tackle the problem, why not? We would support. Now, what we would have liked is that there be dialogue and new elections. That's what we'd like to see. We would like to see elections uh, where uh, people would enjoy the freedom to choose who governs them. If we see you, there's been a many um, shortcomings in the whole electoral procedure. So uh, I would uh, say that uh, it is necessary to look again at the constitution of Venezuela, have to look at the laws, and also have to look at what has happened in the past. Now, I don't know whether the assembly would have the power to appoint uh, someone as a president. I think it, we would really have to look uh, to what the rules say. Thank you. I think uh, the uh, regional governments have to speak with one voice, indeed, as does the international community. Now, this is a legal issue that you're raising here. You're talking about the legitimacy or non-legitimacy of this. Uh, but uh, also, it's a case of real politic. Now, I think uh, what it, we have uh, to look at is what is best for the people of Venezuela. Now, the actual people. What is best for the people of Nicaragua? You can't just uh, think in... Uh, 
general terms or legalistic terms. But uh, you have to think, will this resolve the crisis or not? I think that is the nub of the issue. What is the way in which we're going to resolve this? And I think that is what we have to be looking at. Now, we believe in institutions. We believe in democratic institutions. And I think it has to be the people who can have an open, fair elections with observers and that they can then determine their fate. And that, that is what we would like uh, to see in uh, Venezuela and uh, Nicaragua. Now, uh, th indeed, uh, this was uh, in uh, a route that was followed in many Latin American countries in the past, and it uh, stopped conflicts. So I think we have to look at an overall joined up and holistic approach to this. Well, uh, my foreign minister is with me, and uh, he's looking at me, and uh, so he doesn't want me to say too much, I know that. He wants me to be diplomatic, but I'm not going to be. We would recognize, we would recognize Mr. Rio as a uh, president, because we believe that we have to send out a clear message, and uh, this is going to ha help redress the balance, and uh, this could then lead uh, to a broad dialogue. Anything that helps to uh, liberate uh, Venezuela would get our support and our vote. Please tell us who you are. Lourdes Casanova from the Cornell University in New York. Chinese uh, um, investment is not only growing, but when there were changes of government in Brazil and uh, when it went from Rousseff to Temer, for example, in Brazil, now I think it's a bit naive to think that there's going to be a different investment that is going to help develop the region because uh, this uh, has a political effect because uh, China has got about 10% uh, of a PDSA, the oil company in uh, Venezuela. And uh, therefore, has there been uh, any uh, change in how we see Chinese investment? Um, what do presidents uh, think about that? Well, just one of them. Which of them are you asking? Because, okay, President Moreno. We don't have much time. President Moreno. Which? Which? There's two Morenos. The President Moreno. You have to choose one of the two. The President of Ecuador. Because I think he would give a good um, answer to this. Now. Without a doubt, China is a very important player in the world economy. In recent years, Ecuador has welcomed uh, China in, and we have uh, had uh, loans. So we've been able to build highways, uh, airports, and uh, we've been able to create uh, infrastructure. And uh, this has been supplied by China. And uh, we have also seen that there have been some drawbacks. In, so I went to China a month ago so that I could uh, talk to Xi Jinping and to say that we had certain uh, issues. And, uh, and uh, the ambassador said that we would resolve those issues. So um, it would be possible for us uh, to continue working uh, with the great people of China in the future and with the government of China so that they can continue to help us fund our development. And clearly, uh, we, want, we work with multilateral organizations as one and the same time, of course. We believe we could uh, say we trust that there will be no problems at the moment uh, by resolving the issues uh, now. Now, uh, actually, uh, about a million dollars has uh, been um, released by China so that we can do our development. Should you tell us who you are? I'm also from uh, Cornell. Now, Mr. Alvarado, there has been a, a tax reform uh, in, which has been difficult both within the country and outside of it. What uh, have been your keys uh, to achieving that, that fiscal reform. And President Moreno, when will these uh, tax reforms come in so that the region can grow? 
Well, in uh, Costa Rica, we've had it more than 20 uh, years uh, with the problem with the uh, public finances. Uh, so basically, uh, there was a high level of indebtedness. And the key to what we did was, well, uh, it sounds simple now. I mean, basically, where there's a will, there's a way. It was determination that we had. We had a 90-day strike in the education sector, a strike. I mean, it was a peaceful strike, but it was still a strike. But we had to do this so that we could make this change. Because if you actually bring in these reform and if you sort out your problems of liquidity, it means that we weren't, didn't have to cut any of our social programs it also meant that uh, there was uh, um, stable funding of uh, public services and uh, there is a stability uh, which is what we need so that we can uh, really um, uh, relaunch a uh, contracting economy uh, but uh, ultimately I would put it all down to determination because otherwise I wouldn't be talking about growth of Costa Rica now I'd be here asking you know, cap in hand asking for support well very quickly Countries who do not uh, have uh, a tax take of more than 15 percent, it's going to be very difficult for them to become viable. And there are still Latin American countries who are below that 15 percent line. Uh, but uh, for years, though, uh, we had a demographic bonus. Now, uh, I think a country such as the UK, it uh, took 65 uh, years uh, for people to come uh, uh, start retiring. So you have 20% of the population retiring. And uh, at the same time, uh, it's uh, 20, 25 years. So uh, there is a uh, great tax pressure in our countries, and these are huge tax pressures. And uh, the be sooner we can deal with this, the better. But as the presidents have said, uh, it uh, doesn't make anybody popular when you do this, when you change these systems. Uh, but you have to do it, and it is transformative. Now, I think there was a question down here. Thank you, Ishan Theroux at the Washington Post. Uh, just earlier this afternoon, President Bolsonaro of Brazil celebrated a number of recent victories for center-right or right-wing governments in the region. Uh, I would ask the Honorable Presidents, do you see a broader political realignment or consolidation taking place in Latin America? And what are your hopes for the new right-wing government in Brasilia? Could you please uh, select um, one of the presidents? I, I defer the selection to you. <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to answer about uh, the, the, whether Latin America is moving to the right? Well, we have to ask President Moreno. We asked President Moreno. No, no, you see, we move for the center this way very quickly. Okay, okay. I think the challenge that we have as a region is uh, we need to make progress without necessarily having a total consensus. I, but I think we have to have shared goals that we want diversity. There's diversity up here on this panel. Uh, but there's also an ability to work together. And I think what we have to aspire to is that as a region. I also believe that uh, any extreme is not going to benefit the world. And uh, therefore, I think we have to try and strike balances here and work together. And that is what I would go for, rather than talk about, uh, about whether it's extreme left or extreme right. I think what people really care about, rather than those, is their own uh, well-being. And I think that is something that uh, unites us all. And I think we should work on that. Alberto Moreno. Lenny Moreno. Carlos Alvarado and Maria Abdedo Benitez have given us a great um, snapshot of the uh, situation of what the uh, region is facing, and they've told us what they're doing in their countries to. Uh, so, applause, please. So, an applause. There you are.